and we are live. Hi, Raisal. Hey, hi, Jason. How are you? Yep, I'm good. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on Thursday. And I'm Jason from the Google Developer Relations team. And this is Raisal from Data Science Singapore. And we are really excited for today's collaboration with Data Science Singapore and the Gojek team. And before we begin today's session, uh, let me just briefly introduce uh, what Google Developer Space does and um, what this is all about. So um, for those of you who are not familiar, Google Developer Space has a physical uh, space in the Google Singapore office. But due to COVID, um, everything moved online. So we started this YouTube channel as well. And we regularly host events with developers and startup communities from around the region. So do subscribe to our YouTube channel if you are tuning in from there now. And keep in touch with us on all our different social media channels. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to Raisal to share more about today's session. Yeah, thank you very much, Justin. So yes, we are very grateful to always, you know, uh, be in partnership with Google. Uh, yeah, they've been very, uh, yeah, uh, they've been very helpful in ho hosting uh, all these meetups. So yeah, uh, I'm from the, I'm Raisal from Data Science SG. So if it's your first time attending a Data Science SG meetup, uh, we're basically a uh, uh, a community in Singapore that you know basically we bring in people who are interested in this domain of data science, um, you know, you know, AI. Uh, you know, we just bring in speakers from you know from all sorts of backgrounds to to come and interact and share skills. Of course, pre-COVID, we we meet up in physical spaces, but hey, uh, now we'll just stick with this. But all's good. Uh, and for today, uh, we are just you know incredibly grateful to have uh, Gojek. All right. Uh, back in 2019, actually, I was there myself for for their for the meetup. Uh, it was in their office, and here again in 2021, we have you know them again to share with us um, on you know several topics, not just one. All right. So we're in for we're in here for a trip. Uh, the event. So let me just before we bring in um, the first speaker all right, from Gojek, uh, let me just give the event outline. All right, so we have about three topics, three uh, on, on the agenda outlined. So first of all, we'll have uh, Sharam from Gojek uh, sharing on um, Gojek Marketplace introduction. And then uh, the second speaker um, after, we'll talk about deep learning co for causal inference uh, by Killian. And then we'll end off uh, the, the final topic, uh, but certainly not the least, will be on running online ML experiments at scale. Uh, which the speaker will be Roman. And then we'll end off today's session. All right, uh, of course, there'll be Q&As, uh, opportunity for you to ask questions. So please feel free uh, to comment on YouTube or you know the, the Facebook comments on whatever questions you might have. Uh, so yeah, um, Justin, thank you very much for the introduction. So now I'm gonna bring uh, you know the first speaker from Gojek over. So we'll see you in a bit. Yep, see you. Hey guys, thank you so much, especially um, to the organizers, Raisal and Jessin, everybody in the DSSSG team, and of course, especially to you, the audience, for making it this evening. So we're from the Gojek team, which I hope doesn't need a long introduction, so I'll spare you too many details. Um, so our goal is to connect consumers with the best providers in the most frictionless way possible. So if that, um, just to get into a little bit more detail, we started in 2014 with Sister Call Center. So today it's, uh, you know, we're in five countries and doing a little bit more complicated things than what we did at the call center, which hopefully we can get into more today. So today this is even shocks me. I'm not sure if this is even 20, it could be more, but there's a lot of services that um, Gojek has. So the question, which I suppose is more relevant to this group now, is how do we organize ourselves as a data organization, given this incredible complexity, right? So there's no way I can faithfully represent everything in one slide. So we're going to focus on perhaps um, you know one of the teams which I think would be of interest today, which is the marketplace team. So if you look at think about those services which I showed you previously, there's we, we call them product groups, and they are the groups that actually interact directly with the customer. So if you think about the data science problems they're looking at, it's very user-centric. So things like personalization, recommendations, search, things like this. 
And then you've got Marketplace, which I like to think of it as the platform for Gojek. So all of these business-centric groups actually run on the Marketplace platform. And the kind of problems we look at in Marketplace is a little bit different. They've got a bit of an economics tint to it. So most of the problems, if you are at Marketplace, are really thinking about balancing trade-offs. So things like demand versus supply, um, you know, reliability. Um, you know, some examples on the slides here, things like pricing. Matchmaking is where you decide which bid should uh, from a customer should go to which driver, right? And we've got Jawad here today, who is the head of data in Marketplace as well as, of course, the speakers. Um, and then you've got data science platform, which, unlike the slide may suggest, actually is a platform for all um, data science teams within Gojek. And that's the team that I had. So this is more for sort of an engineering-led uh, uh, platform. So the idea, obviously, being a platform is that we don't want a data science team uh, you know, in team A uh, having to reinvent the build multiple times. So if we see common patterns, we like to make that into a product and offer it to every DS team. So right now, you know, things like feature stores, uh, experimentation, which we'll get into in a little bit, things like this. So that begs the question, what are we going to talk about given there's so many uh, data science problems that we look at? So we tried something new this time. Um, where we actually ask you what you wanted to hear more about, and we put it on Facebook. So thank you so much for everybody who voted. There was a very nice sort of uh, underlying uh, silver lining to this because of the two topics that were the highest rated, um, so we've got deep learning for causal inference and running online ML experiments at scale. One is a very pure data science topic, which Killian will walk you through. And then the other one is a more of a ML engineering topic, uh, which Roman will uh, be walking through. So I encourage you to stick around for both because they're all very interesting. And with that, um, I'd like to hand over to Killian. Take it away, sir. Uh, as a data scientist for the demand generation team. Um, if you are actually, um, uh, am I sharing my slides? Hold on. I think I think we're seeing Roman's screen right now, right? All right, so. Oh. Yes. Okay. So you're good to yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I'm part of the demand generation team, and um, if you're lucky enough actually to to join Gojek, you will see that we like to give ourselves uh, cool names. Uh, so in the informal the informal team for the demand generation team is uh, Gobstopper, and if your work gets enough traction, you will even get your own cool sticker. So let's deep dive into the topics. So I'll be talking about uh, deep learning for causal inference and how we uh, use it in the context of promotions. Um, so here's the presentation agenda. So first I'll be giving a uh, short introduction on the field of causal inference, uh, which is actually a field that's been, I would say it's been as old as statistics as general. Uh, then I'll be talking about the learning application to causal inference. And I do want to apologize in advance to the non-technical audience, to the audience not familiar with uh, the building. It's going to get uh, a bit technical. Uh, and if I haven't completely lost you by the, uh, the presentation, uh, I'll have a few more exciting information for you uh, at the end of my presentation. So yeah, let's get into inference and what actually it means. Um, so initially, causal inference, um, the medical field. Uh, doctors were really concerned with, oh, if we give a patient a treatment, uh, what, will be, what will be the impact on the patient? And then what if the doctor doesn't? Then what will be the impact as well? Uh, but for good, actually, this is very um, interesting in the of marketing. So if we give a customer promotion, uh, for instance, we're interested to know in we're interested to know how much more uh, users will transact. And in that sense, we're interested in what we call uh, incremental transactions. So let me give you an example of uh, incremental transaction calculator. Uh, so let's say that Mr. K, right? and Mr. K right here with any promotion, completed, uh, five transactions within a week. Then we have a parallel universe. And in this, Turn universe, let's say that Mr. K was given a yellow promotion, and then he completed eight transactions as a result of being given a promotion. 
And then uh, if you do uh, basic maps, uh, actions with promotion, minus five transactions without promotion, you get three incremental transactions. Um, I guess I already know what you're thinking. You must be thinking, yeah, but uh, it's not really possible for now to access the alternate universe. Um, so it brings the nature of uh, the uh, counterfactual nature of causal inference. As you can imagine, causal inference is uh, very useful to identify users that are most sensitive to promotions. Uh, but it's actually counterfactual by nature because if you think about it in your training set, uh, we only have outcomes of customers with or without treatments. And by the way, um, I'm gonna use the terms treatment and promotions quite interchangeably uh, for other presentations. So if you hear me say treatment, think about promotion. And if you hear me say promotion, uh, think about treatments. And as you can imagine, then uh, because it's counterfactual, it's impossible to get the uh, actual incremental transaction on an individual. And that means that actually we can use the more uh, basic traditional uh, machine learning algorithms. And what I mean by um, counterfactual is that if you take a look at this dummy data set, for instance, at the first row, uh, we have one user with that is assigned a treatment and then we have its measured outcome. And then on the second row, uh, this user was not given a uh, treatment. Uh, and then uh, we still see the recorded outcome as well. And as you can see, um, as you can imagine, there are a couple of challenges uh, with respect to causal inference. And there are four main ones. Uh, the first one, which I'm going to be talking about extensively, is called the selection or confounding bias. And by that, uh, this bias is actually created by the fact that we may get a data set uh, where the treatments were not given randomly. And I wanna, I'm going to expand on this later. Uh, there is a huge variety in available treatments. So we have different types of promotions. Um, you know, like for Gojek, we may have uh, discount percentages, we may have cashbacks, we may have uh, price deductions. So yeah, uh, quite a bit variety. And that entails uh, uh, the heterogeneity in treatment effects. Um, so if you think about it, you know, like some people, some customers may prefer a, a discount percentage while others may prefer a uh, cashback. So when we model this problem, our model should be able to take into account like this diverse variety of treatment and the uh, uh, heterogeneous reactions. And last but not least, uh, there is also a hard validation. Uh, because of the counterfactual nature of it, uh, to basically gauge uh, which model is better, you actually need to experiment with the cause inference model online. And that means that you know you cannot use traditional machine learning validation such as you know trade test set or even uh, cross validation. And I do want to remind you that this is going to be a more um, technical presentation. So uh, to get you warmed up, I'm going to introduce my first uh, mathemat mathematical not notations. Uh, so let's say that we have a variable t uh, that takes the value uh, one if the customer is given a promotion and zero otherwise. We have x that is a feature vector that is, I guess, traditional to any machine learning problem. And y is our measured outcome. So in the context of marketing Gojek, that's the number of transactions, for instance. And the underlying idea behind uh, causal inference is this one. So we have a treatment effect uh, tau, which uh, uh, that is a function of x. And basically tau of x is the difference between the uh, interventional expectation of giving, a, of giving a treatment and the interventional expectation of um, not giving a treatment. And for those of you who are familiar with statistics, uh, this is slightly different from uh, conditional probability. Uh, because in conditional expectation, what you do is actually you're just modeling the joint distributions between uh, two variables, sort of modeling the randomness uh, between two variables. Uh, here, you are not really modeling the randomness, you're modeling the um, sort of the intervention, which is not random, because you sort of have uh, the decision-making power over uh, which treatments you are going to give. So this is slightly different. Hence, this is why you see the, the do operator uh, right here. 
And there are uh, current state-of-the-art methods, uh, such as double machine learning, uh, doubly robust learning. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about these today, but I do encourage you to um, maybe look into these. Um, so those are very uh, general methods, but in practice, actually, they work mostly with, uh, you know, like tree-based algorithm, uh, like think about uh, random forest or even like the boosting algorithm, such as XGBoost, uh, to estimate those treatment effects. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about the uh, HiSci model, uh, which is actually one deep learning application uh, of two causal inference. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, causal inference is uh, a very old field. Uh, but the paper that I'm going to be presenting today was published in 2020, so quite recent, uh, by uh, Tata Consulting Research. And actually, the advantages of uh, deep learning over the uh, existing uh, causal inference libraries is that, um, yes, you have to code everything from scratch. Uh, but at the same time, it's more flexible, so it's easier for debugging. And the advantage as well with the high side in particular is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like you have, if you have a wide variety of treatments, uh, the default architecture of this model actually enables to uh, account for this uh, big variety of, of treatments. Uh, but before I deep dive into the uh, model architecture, uh, let me uh, define more precisely uh, the confounding bias, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, so a confounder is basically a variable that may impact both the treatment and the measured outcome. Um, so if you go back to the medical field, for instance, uh, let's say that you are a doctor and you may prescribe a drug uh, based on the gender or even the age of the patient uh, because you, know, you want to cater to the needs of the patient. Uh, so the drug is going to impact the recovery, uh, but let's say like the gender or the age is also going to impact the recovery. Um, and basically, uh, because the doctor used some, some features or some criteria, uh, this is going to be a non-random allocation. And as a result of this non-random allocation, we often get a bias of the features towards the treatments in our training data set. And we're going to need to address this um, bias in order to properly estimate the treatment effect. And you may be wondering, oh, but what would be the confounding variables um, for um, uh, promotion, uh, marketing or promotions. Um, so for instance, you know, like let's say that you are a marketing team. Uh, let's say like you have frequent users and you may prefer to give them promotion A. And for the non-frequent user, you, are, you prefer to give them uh, promotion B. Um, and yeah, that results into a uh, non-random allocation. Um, here is the uh, model overview. Uh, this uh, basically high side consists of uh, two networks. One is the uh, decorrelating network and the outcome network. And I'm going to be explaining each of the building blocks of this model. Um, but before, uh, before I um, explain a bit more the architecture, uh, let me get you started with the uh, model inputs. Um, so what it takes is a, a classical, I guess, uh, feature vector x and a one-hot vector t uh, that basically indicates the um, which treatment is assigned. As an output, you have a vector of k treatment outcomes. So for instance, the number of transactions. And each element of the vector uh, records the outcome. Um, so let me give you uh, an example. So for instance, let's say that we have uh, three treatments or three promotions in total. Uh, you have a sample that is assigned the second treatment. And then uh, the outcome vector will look like this. So as the first element of the vector, you have zero because it's not assigned the first treatment. Uh, second element is 3.5, let's say 3.5 transactions. And then uh, the third element of the vector is zero uh, because it was not assigned the um, third treatment. Uh, in terms of um, you know, like neural network and you know, layers and things like this, uh, I do want to mention that those layers are a bit I would say boring, so there's no uh, convolution, there's no LSTM, it's mostly uh, dense layers. Uh, but what is interesting is actually uh, different loss functions uh, that we are going to use uh, for the color inference problem. So I'm mostly talking about the different loss functions. And before I do that, um, 
before I introduce the encoder decoder network that we'll use as the decorrelation part, uh, let me do a toy example to basically uh, illustrate the confounding bias. So assume that we have a treatment distribution of three kinds of promotion. Uh, we have a data set of 10 features, and let's take a look at customer A. So the first thing that I want to introduce is my unbiased overall treatment distribution. Uh, so that's my normal distribution that is unbiased. I have a uh, feature vector uh, A, uh, XA, that corresponds to customer A. And what the confounding effect means is that the treatment distribution conditional to the features of customer A may be different from the original unbiased distribution of all treatments. So for instance, let's say that customer A may be biased to uh, heavily to the third treatment, slightly to the second treatment, and not at all to the first one. The treatment distribution conditional to the features of customer A may look like this. So for instance, in the first treatment, there's a 0% probability that it's going to get it. Um, second treatment is slightly biased, so there's a 20% that is going to be assigned to it. And the first treatment is heavily biased, so let's say 80%. And what we want to do actually is that uh, through this uh, encoder-decoder network, we are going to learn a, re a representation of the 10 features as a five-dimensional vector. So I have my original feature vector right here. And I want to learn a representation phi of the XA of five dimensions. And I'm going to learn this representation such that the uh, treatment distribution conditional to my representation is slightly equal, I mean, is approximately equal to my original unbiased distribution. And so with this example, allow me to introduce my encoder-decoder network. Yeah. So um, through gradient descent, we are going to learn a debiased re representation of our initial feature vector. Um, so I have an encoder uh, phi right here uh, that basically takes a, a feature matrix of uh, n samples and p features and, as an input. And then it outputs a representation layer phi of x of dimension n times l, where l is much smaller than p. And if you think about the previous example, uh, p here would be uh, 10 features, and my l here would be uh, five features. And then I pass this uh, representation layer phi of x into a decoder psi. And what this decoder psi, it, basically takes the representation and then it outputs a decoded layer psi of phi of x back to the original date dimensions uh, n times p. And then for those of you who are familiar with uh, encoder-decoder networks, uh, this is my first uh, classical encoder-decoder loss, which is not very innovative. So if you take a look at the terms right here, what this is is simply the uh, L2 norm of the vector difference uh, between the original feature vector and the decoded layer, um, yeah. So um, if you are basically like what this enables is that my phi of x uh, will keep a degree of similarity to my um, my original feature vector. Uh, but yeah, this is very classical encoder decoder loss. This is not very innovative. The uh, second loss function to introduce, and this is the actually actually the function that's going to enable us to. Uh, tackle the confounding bias, which I just introduced. Uh, so before I, int I introduce this last function, uh, let me uh, give you a few assumptions reminder. So my uh, overall treatment distribution, P of T, is unbiased. Uh, but my conditional distribution um, for treatment, uh, P of T given phi of X, is biased. Uh, so this equation right here is what we call the cross-entropy measure. And the cross entropy measure is actually directly proportional to what we call the KL divergence. So the KL divergence is a, a distance measure between two distributions. And so uh, basically, the uh, the smaller the distance, uh, be, uh, the smaller the KL divergence between two distributions will be. Then that means like, yeah, the the less difference there will be between the two distributions. And in a sense, because the cross entropy measure is di directly proportional to the KL divergence, if you are minimizing this uh, cross entropy loss, it's as if you are sort of minimizing the distance between uh, my unbiased distribution, a P of T, 
and my p of t given phi of x. And this is how you make it, this is how you debias your conditional distribution in a way. And now you may be wondering, oh, but how do I get p of t and how do I get uh, p of t given phi of x? So for p of t given phi of x, uh, it's actually very uh, standard learning procedure. Uh, so basically what you do is you take your representation layer phi of x and you pass that into a uh, softmax layer. And for p of t, uh, if you don't understand this uh, fancy notation, don't worry about it. Uh, what this means is just that um, you are just counting the proportion for each treatment uh, within your training set and you basically get your uh, treatment distribution. Uh, in blue is a uh, regularizing function. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about it, but it's actually quite interesting. So if you're interested in it, like feel free to just check out the original paper. Uh, but for the sake of brevity, uh, let's skip it. And that actually enables me to introduce my first uh, decorrelation loss function. And so just a reminder, so the first term right here, LC of phi is my cross entropy measure that enables me to um, uh, debias my representation layer. My uh, LAE right here is my classical encoder decoder function, uh, which is, yeah, uh, which enables me to uh, preserve a degree of similarity um, of the original feature vector. And I have my uh, regularization term. And then beta and gamma are hyperparameters which you can tune based on uh, your preferences. And then uh, for my final last function, uh, what uh, the final layers are gonna take as an input is a concatenation of two things. Uh, phi of x, uh, which is the debias feature representation that we learned uh, from the previous last function. And then Tn is a one hot vector that indicates the treatment recorded for sample n. And then for my outcome loss function, uh, if you remember from uh, the introduction slide, what I said is that the output of the neural network will be a, an outcome vector of size k treatments. Um, so let's say that you know, like you have uh, three treatments in total, then uh, your outcome will be uh, the outcome that you're trying to predict is a vector of three dimensions. Um, so in the paper, let's say that you have y n that is the original. Uh, feature uh, outcome vector, and then you have y hat n, that is the prediction uh, for this uh, outcome vector. And then you simply introduce an RMSE uh, between each element of the vector. And that is actually very um, typical uh, machine learning loss function to uh, basically make sure that you um, predict your outcome um, well enough. And then the final loss function to minimize becomes this. So just a quick reminder. So my LC of phi is my cross entropy measure that enables me to get my uh, unbiased representation uh, feature. This one is the classical encoder decoder uh, loss function. This one is the regularizing term that I skipped. And then this one is my outcome loss function, which is a, a standard uh, RMSC loss function. And then beta, uh, gamma and um, lambda are hyperparameters, uh, which you can tune as well. Yeah, um, sorry if it was a bit heavy, uh, but if you found what I said very interesting, uh, sorry, um, one more session uh, before I, I move on to the uh, GovTop information. Um, so if I give you the, um, if you remember earlier what I said that the goal was to, uh, make incremental predictions, that the goal of causal inference is to uh, estimate the treatment effects, meaning the difference between the interventional expectation and the interventional expectation of not giving a treatment. So how do we do that with the high side model? Uh, so first thing you have to do is actually including a control group inside your training set. Uh, basically, you wanna include people who have not been given any promotion um, to have that in, um, to generate your incremental prediction. So that would correspond to uh, uh, t is equal to zero here. So you take a feature vector x of a customer 
And then we have a one hot vector that is indexed as the control treatment. You generate a control prediction. So that, that would be your term right here. And then with the same feature vector x and the one hot vector that is indexed as the treatment. So you generate a treatment prediction, this term right here. And then the simple, the, 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 the last thing you have to do is simply to subtract this control prediction here from the treatment prediction, and you get your treatment effect. Yeah, um, so I hope I haven't completely lost you. Uh, but if you are excited about what you heard and if these are things that uh, you would see yourself working on, um, we actually have uh, two open positions uh, for uh, GovTapper and we also have um, uh, for data scientists and also for uh, analyst roles. Uh, so not just data scientists actually. Uh, you can check them out on LinkedIn or Liver. And yeah, if you have any questions about what you heard, um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn at uh, Killian Tep. Yeah, so uh, if there are any questions, yeah, I'm free to take them now. All right, thank you very much, Killian. So yeah, I think um, there are a number of questions. Um, yeah. Well, um, someone's asking why I treat why are tree-based methods preferred for such applications? If you would like to answer that, I mean, if if that's the case where tree-based methods are preferred, um, that's a that's a good question. Actually, I mean, I um, from from I I don't know why there are, maybe like the the short answer would be that um, those techniques have have been around for uh, longer than deep learning, um, so. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I I don't have the the answer. I just know that um, for me, like the the only short answer I could give would be that, um, yeah, I guess uh, tree based methods have been around for longer for more traditional like sort of regression problems and structured data, and usually with causal inference you deal with structured data. So I, I would assume that tree based methods uh, were preferred for um, such applications. Yeah. And also like deep learning is, you know, it was mostly used for uh, computer vision NLP. So I guess uh, intuitively it doesn't really make sense to use it for code inference, but now we do, yeah. Uh, how do you make sure that P of T estimated from the training data uh, is unbiased? Uh, that's a very good question. It's actually an, an assumption from the, uh, because P of T is an assumption from the paper. So um, what you can do, you know, like there are some, if you are not really satisfied with the, uh, I guess like the initial population distribution is that, uh, you know, you can do like oversampling or subsampling until you get a uh, uh, probability distribution that you deem yourself unbiased. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other questions that uh, anyone would like to post? Let me see if anyone on Facebook has no questions. Um, if 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 you want, uh, I can I can elaborate a bit. Uh, I, I think I've seen I think I've seen another comment. Um, so the question, like, the, I think there's a bit of confusion between uh, unbiased and. Uh, uh, it's uh, unbiased and um, and uh, biased. So in a sense, you assume that the overall um, population is unbiased, but what is biased is actually the, um, the uh, conditional probability. So in a sense, the conditional probability would be biased uh, because, you know, like, um, uh, let's say like a doctor, you know, is going to target uh, more specific uh, patients based on their genders and their age. So obviously, like you don't expect the general population to have a treatment distribution um, for, you know, like say, like a, a senior person uh, who is female. So yeah, that's the that's the that's the idea behind this. Yeah. Uh, is significant testing uh, finding p-value available for this method? Um, no. It's not available for this method because you are trying to estimate the 
uh, treatment effect. Uh, what you can do though at the end uh, to see if um, you know, like you have estimated it uh, properly, is that once you deploy your model to production, uh, because um, once you deploy your and you have you know like a targeted group and you have a control group, and the group that was targeted was the one with your model, uh, you can actually see if uh, you know by by making like the overall group, you can actually uh, compare the two groups, and then make uh, hypothesis testing to see if your your algorithm was uh, correctly targeting those those, um, those customers. Uh, but in the design of the in the design of the um, of the algorithm, no, there is no uh, uh, such thing as p value. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, we have. Uh, so we have, of course, someone asking about A/B testing. You know, the differences and similarities. Okay. Uh, I, actually, A/B testing and causal inference are very, very related, uh, in a sense that. Um, I mean, if I if I if I if I actually um, you know like um, go a bit outside of the scope of my of the of the paper I just presented, uh, actually A/B testing is key for causal inference because the primary example the the primary use of causal inference uh, was actually through A/B testing in a sense that if you want to see if the treatment has an effect, you get a control group on you know like an A group, and then on the B group you get a treatment group. So I would say cause inference in its most basic form is actually A-B testing. Yeah. All right, uh, Kilen. So I guess uh, that's all the que that's all the question that we can uh, answer for now. Uh, I think you know as as yeah this question basically I think will we'll, you know bring in nicely for uh, bring in the next topic nicely. Uh, so the next topic uh, that we presented by Roman. Uh, he will be touching on you know running online ML experiments at scale. So yeah, uh, again, thank you very much, Kilian. So yeah, yeah my uh, pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, uh, we're gonna bring in Roman now. Okay. Okay. All right, hi Roman. All right, hi, hi Rizal. Um Thanks right. a lot, Kilian, for wrapping it up. That was very interesting and very intense. Um, so my topic will be hopefully uh, slightly easier to digest. Uh, so let's just start. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Today we'll talk about the online ML experiments and how do we run them at scale um, in Gojek. Um, quick intro from my side. Uh, I'm Roman Wozniak, lead product engineer from the data science platform team. Um, I joined Gojek about two years ago, and since then I've been working on the different components of Gojek a machine learning platform. Um, here's the outline what, uh, of what we will cover today. Uh, so we'll start with the describing a problem space, uh, then move uh, to how we approach the problem in Gojek. And then I provide a bit more details about the architecture and the features of uh, our solution. And uh, um, to close it up, uh, uh, I'll uh, give you some ideas about our future plans for, uh, for the development. Um, so let's start with the problem space first, right? Um, hopefully many of you are familiar with the uh, ML development lifecycle. It usually starts with the data collection and the exploratory analysis stages, then uh, progresses into the data cleansing and uh, encoding or transformation uh, before data scientists can train their first uh, machine learning model. And after this, the model can be deployed and start serving traffic. Uh, but solving a business problem with machine learning is rarely a one-off task. So experimentation is just uh, closing the loop um, um, and brings data scientists into the new iteration of modeling. Uh, data scientists commonly include on offline uh, model evaluation steps as the part of the uh, model training pipelines, but the offline model evaluation doesn't provide the uh, comprehensive view on the model's performance in the real world conditions. And here's the problem. Uh, setting up uh, online evaluation of the uh, models is uh, tricky because it requires the skill set and the familiarity with the uh, tools, with the technical stack that is fairly different from what the data scientists are using uh, for uh, setting up the offline model evaluation. Hence, a lot of engineering support uh, is uh, required. Before we'll dig deeper into the problem, uh, here's the basic terminology um, I'll be using during my, my talk. Um, let me just focus on the most important, what the experiment is. Um, 
There is some uh, some amount of simplification in what I'll be saying, but in simple words, uh, it's a way of routing traffic to multiple machine learning models models in order to evaluate their performance. So the experiment is usually defined by multiple treatments and uh, the configuration about the proportion of traffic each treatment should receive. And then uh, each treatment is a set of configurations and rules describing on how to produce a response uh, uh, for the current request. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, um, let's take a look on one, um, one use case or one problem that we've been solving at Gojek uh, some time ago. Uh, I hope that many of you have used Gojek application to get the right. Uh, so you might be familiar with the uh, screen uh, screenshot shared here. Um, as a Gojek user, I usually don't want to type the address of my pick application when I order the Go car right. Um, it's possible that uh, I don't know the exact location. So if I'm at shopping mall or something, uh, I, may, I, I probably don't know the address of this place. And also, it's possible that there are multiple pickup uh, points or the drop-off points associated with the same address. So uh, it potentially can cause the problem uh, for the driver to find me and pick me up, right? So instead, I'd prefer to select my pickup location from one of the points available near my location. Um, this problem can be solved purely from the engineering perspective, right? So uh, it can be solved in a way that we can maintain some sort of the uh, database uh, that uh, contains all of uh, all of the uh, pickup points with the geographical coordinates associated to each of the points. And then when a user is placing a new order, we can uh, use some, uh, some sort of uh, geospatial index to fetch all of the points in the radius of, let's say, 10 meters or 20 meters or 50 meters from user's location and show them sorted by Euclidean distance. Uh, but the problem is that in crowded places, um, there could be many uh, pickup points in the close proximity to a user's location. So uh, the experience of making an order will still be suboptimal uh, to the end user. And this is especially crucial in the situation when user is uh, placing an order uh, um, while being inside of a building where the GPS can't reliably pin user's location. Um, so here's the question. Can we improve this with uh, ML model that ranks available uh, pickup points, not just by the distance between the points and the user's location, but also by taking into account some other features uh, as the popularity score of the pickup points uh, and also the uh, historical, um, the, the past history of the given user orders. So if in the past I uh, placed an order from this pickup location, there is a high chance that maybe in the future I will want to use the same uh, uh, pickup location again, right? Um, and the experiment objective is to increase the proportion of orders that are made with a suggested pickup point selected. Uh, so if a user is constantly, if more users uh, during uh, placing and orders are using, uh, are selecting one of the pickup points suggested to them, it means that we are providing the relevant information for them and they don't need to fall back into manually typing the address of, uh, of the location. Um, of course, we don't want to, um, to, to, to roll out this ML-based approach to serve all of our uh, uh, users first without testing this on some smaller uh, population of user. So we can set up something like uh, A-B tests where 90% of the traffic is still served with our existing ranking service and only 10% uh, of the traffic is routed to a newly uh, trained and deployed um, ML ranker. Uh, this can be achieved with the load balancer in front of our rankers and uh, a configuration that assigns corresponding weights to each of the roads. Uh, so can the problem be solved as easy as this? Um, I don't think so. So there are a few of the issues why the simple solution will not work for most of the cases. Um, first, it lacks the flexibility on how to define the traffic split criteria. Um, you should agree that there is a difference between serving 10% of all the requests that are coming to some uh, particular web service as opposite to serving all the requests from 10% of users that are using your web service. 
Uh, and the criteria for uh, the traffic split criteria can be different for the different experimentation. And it's up to data scientists on what uh, on, on how to pick up the experimentation uh, unit for the given uh, um, given experiment. And now what happens if the data science team comes up with the idea for another ML model uh, that they want to, to test? So they might be using other features for training this model, or they might employ the different, uh, uh, different approach uh, uh, for that model. So in this case, they will have to reconfigure this uh, load balancer to uh, split the traffic between uh, three different models and also change the weights that assigns to, uh, to, to each of the roads. So uh, um, in total, there will be still 100% uh, of the traffic distributed between uh, three, uh, three different roads. Um, so some experiments can last only a few hours and having, uh, so it, it, will it probably will require some support from uh, either engineering team or the uh, DevOps team, right? And uh, um, some of the uh, experiments, they can last uh, for quite short period of time uh, in a matter of a uh, couple of hours. And keeping the engineering team or uh, ML um, ops team in the loop uh, will uh, set some constraints or some boundaries on the productivity of the data science team. And that's not something that we want to see in the organization. Uh, and then data scientists, they may want to restrict the experiment group uh, by some other criteria. So uh, probably uh, there will be the cases where they don't want to, uh, uh, to, to use this new ML ranker uh, outside of some uh, geographic area. So maybe they want to have this experiment to be configured only to run in a particular city or a particular state. Um, and such configuration is not naturally supported by the general purpose load balancers. Uh, and a uh, uh, solution will uh, have to either be inflexible or it will require some engineering effort to handle this more sophisticated advanced uh, logic. And last uh, thing is that the setting up experiment is uh, just only the half of the deal. Um, it also required to analyze the experiment results. Uh, and um, that's again, not a trivial task because it requires some uh, data processing and the data collection pipelines together, probably logs from the load balancer and um, persist them in some accessible format that later can be used by the data scientists. So again, uh, engineering team in loop and uh, the constraints on the data science productivity. Um, so here's how we have solved this problem at Gojek with Turing. And what is Turing? Turing is our solution to the online testing and the uh, uh, evaluation of uh, ML models. Um, Turing is fast and supports uh, low latency and high throughput traffic routing to an unlimited number of uh, uh, different ML models. It's extensible, so it's designed to support different type of experiments through the available extension points. Um, it's scalable and cost efficient, and it automatically scales up and down based on the traffic volume. So it can support experiments uh, at Gojek scale and simultaneously keep the infra bills under the control. And last but not least, uh, it's completely self-serve and unlocks different data science team to design and execute any experiments they want. Uh, here's the high level view on Turing score components and the request processing flow. Now let me cover these building blocks one by one. And we will start with um, Turing Rotor. So Turing Rotor is an intelligent routing service that orchestrates the rest uh, of the system together. So it integrates with the optional pre and post processors and the experiment engine to retrieve the information about the treatment that should be applied to a given request. Uh, data scientists, they can define what model should be the part of the experiment by specifying this model HTTP endpoints as roads uh, in Turing Rotor. And uh, in Gojek, uh, our data scientists are using our, our uh, another product that is built by uh, my team as well called Merlin for uh, easily deploying uh, uh, machine learning models uh, into, um, into the production uh, and expose them through the network interface, such as uh, HTTP endpoint. Uh, moving forward, uh, Enricher is an optional service that uh, performs arbitrary tr transformation on the incoming request. Uh, originally, it was designed to uh, give the data scientists uh, the flexibility to, to enrich the incoming request with some features from the external data sources. 
but it also can be just the, uh, some arbitrary pre-processing logic um, uh, written by, in, in the language of uh, user choice. So data scientists should just uh, uh, pack it as, as the simple uh, small uh, microservice, package it in the form of the uh, Docker image, and Turing will take care of, uh, um, of all of the operational aspects of running it, such as deploying, scaling it, uh, monitoring, and orchestrating together with the rest of the system. Uh, next component is Experiment Engine. Uh, so uh, Experiment Engine is, is responsible for uh, managing experiment configuration and running them to generate a treatment for a given request. Um, at Gojic, we use our proprietary experiment management system called Litmus for setting up the traffic split, uh, randomization criteria, the experiment unit for experiment, and treatment configuration. Uh, however, Turing was um, designed in the way to abstract out the experiment engine interfaces, and it can support other experiment engines as applicable modules. Uh, now, Ensembler is the component that encapsulates the logic on how to apply the treatment configuration to responses from ML models for computing the final response that uh, is sent back to the calling uh, system or client. So in a trivial case, uh, there could be like one-to-one -one mapping between the treatment and the tested models. Uh, for instance, if the experiment engine uh, responds with the name of a treatment that should be applied to a given request, such as, let's say, treatment A, in this case, the response from model A should be returned back to the client unaltered. But it's also possible uh, that there are much more complicated assembling logic and that's why Turing also supports the dynamic uh, model assembling, where the final response could be the combination of responses from multiple models. Um, in this case, uh, the interaction uh, uh, between the data scientists and Turing is similar to how in richer works. Data scientists can implement, implement the uh, custom assembler interface uh, as the microservice packet as a Docker image, and then uh, Turing will take care of uh, operational aspects of it. Uh, and the last component is the logs collector, uh, which is responsible for capturing request and response data together with the treatment configuration and pushing this data uh, either to uh, Kafka streams or a BigQuery table. So uh, there are this data is available for data scientists for further analysis uh, and also training the newer version of uh, ML models. And here's how the execution flow looks uh, in Dynamics. So first, the incoming request from the client is sent to the pre-processing stage to enrich the request with futures. Uh, then the router parses the request to extract the experiment unit and, arbit uh, and the arbit uh, attributes of this uh, uh, experiment unit and passes this data to the experiment engine to determine the treatment. So uh, to give you an example, um, uh, the experiment unit can be uh, uh, stored either in the HTTP header or in some uh, field inside of the request payload. Uh, so Turing parses this data based on the provided uh, configuration, extracts this, extract this data, and send it to uh, external experiment engine uh, for running uh, the experiment and retrieving the treat uh, treatment configuration that will be applied to a given request. Uh, simultaneously with sending the data to experiment engine, uh, uh, the, the, the pre-processed request is forwarded to all of the models that are part of this experiment deployment uh, for model serving. And then responses from models are collected and sent to the post processor where uh, they are assembled together um, uh, by applying the retrieved treatment configuration to all of the responses from ML models uh, and sending them back to the uh, client side. And finally, this response is sent back to the client and logs collector writes the request response data to the logs sync, uh, which is, uh, as I mentioned, either the Kafka stream or a BigQuery table. Uh, and later, the last step, which happens already outside of uh, Turing Rotor, uh, so later client can log the outcome data into the logs collector, where this outcome data is joined with the request response data that is uh, logged at the previous step uh, based on some uh, unique tracking ID associated with uh, every request that uh, is uh, processed by, by Turing. So uh, that's the end of the uh, request processing flow and the, basically the 
permanent execution. So what else can Turing do? Uh, before that, let's take a look on what powers Turing under the hood. So if Turing taps on the great scalability of Kubernetes and some uh, other open source components, such as uh, Istio and Knative, um, and the data scientists interact primarily with uh, the UI, Turing UI or Turing console, um, and the Turing console calls the Turing API. So Turing API is a controller with a set of the um, deployment management APIs that translates user-provided rotor configurations into a set of the Kubernetes resources orchestrated together. Um, so Turing also supports multi-tenancy through the Kubernetes namespaces and the role-based uh, access control rules. Um, so uh, the rotor or experiment deployment of one data science team uh, is not affecting the deployments of other data science team because they are isolated. And each Turing rotor is a separate multi-replica deployment that scales up and down within the user provided limit. Um, it means that the during peak hours, more replicas will be automatically added to handle a larger traffic volume. Uh, but during the off peak hours, uh, for instance, uh, uh, during the nighttime, the redundant replicas will be decommissioned to optimize the cluster resources uh, utilization and ultimately to reduce the cost that we are paying uh, for our infrastructure. Um, also, Turing supports more complex traffic rules to roll the traffic to only a subset of uh, model endpoints. Uh, this comes in handy when data scientists want to run experiments that span across different geographies, where the different versions of a model should serve the traffic from uh, different areas. In this case, data scientists, they can uh, specify uh, some conditions, and only if the conditions are met, then the specific model will be activated as the part of this uh, uh, request processing flow. Also, data scientists can uh, make changes to the existing deployments, and Turing will use the blue-green approach to make sure that the updated configuration can be safely deployed before switching to the traffic uh, to the rotor with the updated configuration. Um, and each change to the, uh, uh, to the configuration is captured uh, as a separate version of the deployment, and users can uh, roll back or roll forward between these versions as they need. Uh, and of course, uh, Turing provides a detail, detailed monitoring dashboard to the users out of the box. Uh, so data scientists they can also set up the threshold-based uh, alerts on the key metrics, uh, such as the response latency, throughput, and the error rates, and receive a notification uh, in Slack if, the, uh, if their alert contract is breached. Um, and Turing also demystifies the deployment process by updating scientists with the events timeline, deployment events timeline, and it makes it easy to debug any potential issues with, uh, within the user-defined components, such as Enviter or Ensembler, uh, by exposing container log through Turing console. But having all of these features doesn't mean that we can uh, make Turing even better. Uh, so there are a few broad directions we explore to expand Turing's capabilities. Uh, testing of ML models goes beyond uh, online experiments, because some of the use cases uh, such as uh, presented by uh, Kilian uh, Gobstopper, they are offline by nature, meaning that the model inference is not initiated by the client's request, but is rather triggered based on some recurring schedule or data availability. So for such scenarios, we are working on a standard way of executing batch experiments in Turing. Um, and also, we want to improve the uh, process of experiment result analysis by embedding the outcome metrics visualization into Turing itself. And last, uh, in some scenarios, A-B tests, uh, they are less effective due to the cost network effects. So we want to add uh, into Turing support of other type of experiments, such as the switchback experiments and the contextual bandits. And here's how you can help us to do all of this uh, and even more. We have multiple roles open in the data science platform team, and we, uh, we are building the next generation of machine learning platform. So if you are interested in working with uh, our data scientists and get uh, from them the better understanding of the difficult problems at scale, and if you want to build such a powerful and impactful tools as Turing, uh, please go and explore open roles and contact me directly or reach out to Gojek recruiters. Um, and few more reasons to motivate the right person to do so. Um, the first one is that we believe in open source. 
and we happily contribute our work for the benefit of the data science community. Um, we also use the cutting edge uh, technologies in our day-to-day -day work, and we have the full ownership of our products. And the last one, uh, that's my favorite one, is that the data science platform team is set like a small startup company within a larger organization. So that gives us an extra uh, flexibility on how we operate. Um, and did I mention that Turing is open source? Um, so now I did. Uh, please follow the link or use the QR code for uh, easier navigation uh, and get more technical details about the architecture and the concepts uh, um, of uh, Turing. Or maybe you will even start contributing to the code base. Um, and that's all I have for you today. Thanks a lot for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions if you have some. Thanks. All right. Awesome stuff, Roman. Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, yeah. So Turing and uh, Merlin as well. They are both open source. Yeah. Yep, that's true. Uh, okay. So actually, so myself, I have been. Ex uh, so I guess before we bring in additional questions from the audience, uh, perhaps uh, yeah, because I myself explore many different uh, model serving, um, you know, open source tools. You know, there's Selden Core, there's Bento ML. These have been garnering uh, popularity. Uh, recently, but is there are there distinct motivations behind you know why uh, do you guys actually develop your own set of tools? Oh, that's that's a very good question. So our journey to start building the different products that are uh, orchestrated uh, into a single uh, ML platform started probably at around the beginning of 2019, I guess. So it's almost two years ago. And at that time, we didn't have uh, uh, any solution for the model serving. Um, that was, I mean, the, da the data science team at that time, they've been using um, some uh, ad hoc approaches to uh, to, 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 to serve uh, the traffic as a models. Uh, so we started like doing the uh, exploring and doing some spikes around the available tools at that time. We, 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 we tried to use Selden at that moment of time. Um, it, it didn't provide us with the satisfactory results uh, for the latency of the request uh, of the request processing. Uh, we tried, so we basically delivered the uh, prototype with Seldon, and then we realized that uh, for some of the use cases, the latency constraints or the latency requirements for our use cases is as low as like 10 milliseconds for the entire request processing uh, workflow, and. Uh, after the intensive uh, benchmarking and load testing of Seldon at that moment of time, two years ago, uh, we didn't manage to get to that point. So that's that, that that's how we started exploring the other tools and building the easier to use abstraction on top of this. All right, uh, cool, good. Uh, yeah, I guess I see some, um, what do you call it, components that are perhaps returning go as well. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so um, let's see if we do have any questions. Yeah. Um, would you like to answer this question perhaps, you know, um, by Shengong, why not have a beta group and allow the users who are open to use it to opt into using the other service? Mm. I'm not sure if I can get it. So if the person can elaborate, uh, that will be very helpful. Uh, what is the bet? Oh, I, OK. I, I think uh, I, 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 I get what does it mean. So probably the person is asking why uh, we are just not testing those experimental features or experimental approaches on the uh, beta application, beta version of the application where the users can voluntarily sign up for this beta process. Um, the uh, the use cases for ML experimentation, they are not limited uh, only to something that is kind of directly affecting or directly visible to the user. So there are many approaches that are uh, deep inside of the Gojic infrastructure. So um, uh, it's not always observable or easy to observe for the end, end user. And, and that's why it's basically, I mean, 
it's kind of, you know, there are no uh, tight connection between the, the application or a version of application or the beta version of application and the stable version of application versus the, uh, the, the entire number of uh, ML experiments that are running uh, uh, under the hood uh, inside of project. So for, I mean, uh, just to maybe clarify this, uh, the example that is used here, uh, such as this one with the pickup points, it's just very easily being mapped to the to this scenario when the user might want to, might volunteer to get this, try this uh, new experience and uh, to be suggested the pickup points. Uh, but for some other use cases, so uh, uh, ML models can decide on how to allocate the driver that will be uh, giving you a ride. Uh, and there are many other use cases that is not that straightforward to ask user to either opt in or opt out from. All right. Uh, yeah. I, I th yeah. Thank you very much for answering the questions, Roman. So I guess we can uh, yeah uh, we can bring in Sharam to give the conclusion. So uh, yeah, um, Sharam, would you like to wrap up the sure. session? Thank, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for coming in. Um, just have a bit of sort of personal notes from me. Um, obviously, like as you've seen, building uh, these ML applications is very hard. But I've got sort of three things that I think uh, obviously are helpful. One is um, this is something you know if you're a small startup, I guess it's much harder. But scale obviously helps with having more data. Um, but the last two, I think, are ones which I'm personally learning more and more about. Um, the second one, what I mean by look beyond, so you know, Roman so talked about how we looked at other um, uh, solutions out there, and then we uh, had to make our own. This is sort of is still a new field which is changing a lot. So in in Gojek, we actually run similar kind of uh, meetups within because sometimes some DS teams or engineering teams know something which perhaps the others don't. So uh, in, in, in your own companies, I think it's a really good practice to follow uh, where you always build this learning environment where we're learning what's, what's new out there so you can have a sort of a new fresh set of eyes to solve it. And if you want to be an innovative company, I think this is something which perhaps doesn't get mentioned enough is that you also have to give people the space to make mistakes. Um, you can't expect people to go out there and solve something if the if it going wrong is going to come and bite them and in, especially in the area which we are in with data science it's never a linear process to get to a solution um, perhaps maybe more like engineering so i, I think if uh, whatever if you are a manager who is listening in and sit, uh, sitting in then i think it's a really important topic as well to uh, encourage so these are things which we all try to live by in Gojek. So we hope um, through this uh, presentation that you learned something. And uh, as you saw, we're welcoming applications because we are growing our team. The, the video will be up. So you can see the QR codes for the different uh, job profiles uh, on your own time. And also in the YouTube description, we will be posting a link later on with the PDF if you want to look at this again. With that, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Back to you, Rezal. Yeah. All right. I guess that's about it for today. I, uh, it was a relatively short meeting uh, uh, session, but I think yeah, uh, we we got we got a lot of uh, good learnings. So I hope the audience has enjoyed whatever we have to present. So this video will be up on uh, Google Dev Space, as is YouTube, and as well as their Facebook page. Uh, and yeah, any final call to action, Sharon, on your end? Apply. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Please. All right. Okay, with that, uh, thank you very much, Sharam. All right, uh, Killian, uh, Roman, all right, all the Gojek team in the back. All right, thank you very much. So with that, uh, yeah, please have a good weekend and we'll see you again in the next session. Thank you very much.